kid, I had a passion for digging up old things. I would spend full summers and the long days that made them up pacing up and down the dusty old railway tracks in the woods behind my house. I would walk the trail, head down, shuffling, focus, so that I wouldn't miss the faint glimmer of a rusting railroad spike. I loved uncovering those objects. Apparently, I loved wearing my mask upside down. <laughs> and I'm grateful that my parents were patient enough to clean off all the dust iron that accumulated through the garage as I cleaned them off. And so here I am today, an archaeology student, living out that childhood passion, I guess you could say. But the thing with being an archaeologist is that when you go to a party or you introduce yourself and you say, I'm studying archaeology, the first thing that they ask you about is if you know this guy or if that's what you do. And it's not. So you may imagine us digging through ancient pyramids or diving deep beneath the sea surface to find lost shipwrecks. And while that is certainly what some archaeologists do, it is far from what most of us do and by no means what I do. In fact, I spend most of my time here in the lab. It's not as romantic, I'll tell you that. I don't study artifacts or excavate ancient ruins. I study ancient bones. But okay, what do I really mean when I say I study ancient bones? How much is there to know? Well, I study paleopathology. Paleo meaning old, pathology meaning the study of disease. Yet more precisely, I study paleo-oncology. Paleo again, meaning old, Oncology being the study of cancer. I study ancient cancer, and today I want to share with you what we can learn when we begin to look deeper. One of the tenets of archaeology is that we never take anything from the past. However, if we're willing to make an exception, today, this treasure, rather this perspective, will be yours to keep. My journey began here, with this image. It was included in a scientific paper that described the remains of a two-year-old child from the northern peninsula of Newfoundland, whom belonged to the maritime archaic culture. Not only were the remains more than 4,000 years old, but they showed signs of a disease, perhaps cancer, that forever changed the structure of this child's skeleton. I had known and read about cases of ancient cancer before, but it was after seeing this image that I knew I had to know more. There simply was more to know. I found myself asking, what did this child experience as this disease ran through its entire body? What did the community of people experience as this child slowly weakened, eventually succumbing to a disease they likely had little understanding of? And these weren't the only questions I had but I knew if I were to find any answers, I had to look deeper. And so back in that lab, and using a scanning electron microscope, I was able to look 5,000 times deeper. What was great was at this magnification, discoveries just present themselves. You see, our bones are a lot like glaciers. They're dense, composed of many different layers, and like our bones, seemingly impenetrable yet they are not invulnerable. When glaciers are exposed to heat, pools of water collect on their surface. And when bones are exposed to cancer, cells called osteoclasts that are naturally occurring in our body, but when cancer becomes active in the body, they proliferate out of control. And what they do, these osteoclasts, they create holes in the bone surface, craters really. And these craters look like this they mimic or mirror those same glacial pools. And in glaciers, what we get are these called glacial moulins. Those pools of water develop deep into the glacial core, creating waterfalls and holes that run all the way throughout the glacier. In bone, those cancerous osteoclasts bore just as deep, 
leaving similar patterns of destruction. And like the glacier that drifted over Newfoundland more than 10,000 years ago and left rocks like these, called glacial erratics, cancer too leaves a subtle trace of its once immense force. The globules here are called calcospherites. They are balls of calcium and phosphorus that are excreted by those osteoclasts. In healthy bone, they're normally recycled, but here they are left behind, like erratics on the tundra, as a testament to the great forces that once shaped this landscape. But it's easy to spot those boulders as you drive across the province, or to see an iceberg floating outside the St. John's Narrow. But finding evidence for ancient cancer, even for researchers, is incredibly rare. This is because just a few thousand years ago, cancer did not exist at the same scale as what we see it today. Cancer, whether we like it or not, is a disease of civilization. It is a result of living longer, of exposing ourselves to the things that come along with development and technologies. What we see here in this graph is the expected rate of increase for cancer in the next 20 years. It's a 70% increase. So what that means is the current number globally for diagnoses of cancer per year, 14 million, will be 22 million by the time 2022 hits us. What this really means is that it will be our generation that will compose the predicted 22 million lives to be affected by cancer annually. So equally, it must be our generation to rise to the challenge and meet this health crisis. It must be our generation to become the medical professionals to employ new, innovative solutions to this growing health challenge. We must be ready to look at and act on cancer in ways that we have never before. But I want us to know, is there a way for us to step beyond statistics or biology or beyond the capacity of the naked eye? Is there an issue that exists here that is deeper than what is first sight? Research involves us to see things from new perspectives. In my research, I'm exploring a new way of imaging bone in the third dimension. And it's at this point in my talk, I would invite you all to put on your 3D glasses as we look at the next few images. And it may take some time for the bones to invite you in and to gain that perspective that with time, it seems like the bones only become more deep. You see, as archeologists, we are always concerned with what we find. Yet we rarely ask ourselves, what's missing here? Well, what's missing here are the blood vessels, bone marrow, and the flowing blood that once filled these now empty caverns. When we take the time to see what once filled these bones, we can recognize that these bones, more than 4,000 years ago, housed a human life. The bones were always a person, but sometimes it is a change of perspective that is required of us to acknowledge that the scientific work we do is not merely with specimens. I've never lived in a maritime archaic longhouse. I've never hunted caribou on the exposed northern coast, nor have I ever processed harp seal with tools I'd carved from the stones around me. And so when I go to a museum and pull out trays of artifacts, looking at harpoon heads or the reconstructions of those longhouses, it is hard for me to ever imagine myself in that world. But this world, although seemingly more alien, it is perhaps more familiar. I've lost loved ones to sickness. I faced health challenges myself. We all have. And everyone in this room has experienced the reality that comes with that adversity. Sadness, loss, anxiety, confusion, frustration. These are human feelings. They are just as natural as the biological processes that hurt and heal us.
the diseases that affected individuals throughout history, biologically, psychologically, and emotionally, still affect individuals today. What we learn through this is that we do not need to live the same way of life to share similar experiences of being. We are tied to the maritime archaic and all people of history in ways that transcend time and space. So looking deeper does not just require us to zoom in 5,000 times. Sometimes it will require us to change the lens through which we see the world, to see old bones in new ways, to hear the stories that they have to tell. I'm not an expert in this field. I'll be frank with you, I'm just an undergraduate student. But I do know that we are visitors to this earth and only here for a fraction of a second. It is our responsibility to unearth these narratives, to create new understandings, and to push forward the boundaries of human knowledge to help those who are, and those who certainly will, face the adversity that is cancer. I didn't know it then, but I was learning a valuable life lesson the days I would spend walking up and down the railway tracks in my hometown. Committing ourselves to uncovering small pieces of history, whether they are railroad spikes or the bones of ancient lives, allow us to piece together an understanding of life in the present. With this, we must use the past to give us perspective on the future and use the present to affect that positive change in our world. <laughs>